Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the bridge. It's good to see you guys today, and uh, just a couple of quick announcements at the beginning. Uh, today is coming up uh, the week right after Thanksgiving, which I think would be December 1st is that Sunday. We've got two things happening that evening. Uh, one is uh, our church has a relationship with Healing Haiti, and we are looking at our next trip. And if you want to learn more about Haiti or have any interest in Haiti at all, either going or learning more about it or praying more informatively for the country of Haiti, there is an interest meeting that Sunday night, December 1st, from 5 to 6 p.m., so uh, just kind of be aware of that. It's been in emails and announcements, and we'll try to blast it on Facebook, but want to let you guys know about that. And then also we have our monthly corporate prayer meeting uh, that night also, December 1st at 6 p.m. So 5 p.m. will be the Haiti meeting, 6 p.m. will be a prayer meeting. And then I think we're looking at the following Sunday evening doing some Christmas caroling of sorts. And there's some other details that will be forthcoming about that probably by next week as well. So our call to worship today is from the book of Jeremiah. We're in 1 Corinthians for sermons, but we have one verse that's pretty familiar. It's Jeremiah 33.3. And it's an invitation for us to call on the Lord. And it says this, Call to me and I will answer you and will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. And sometimes when we hear something that we don't know and we don't know if it's great, then we may be a little bit nervous. But God says we can call on him and he will tell us great things that we didn't know before. So it is a hope and prayer of mine that today, as a corporate body, together we would call on the Lord and that we would be having open ears today to hear the great things that he wants to tell us. So I invite you to stand, greet someone you know, and we'll prepare to sing.
God of Wonders, I get to share a little story with you today. Um, so I was out this weekend, and I went out to sit in a tree in the woods. You can figure out what the rest of that's about. I did have a bow and arrow with me. But anyway, so uh, sitting there early, going out about 5 o'clock yesterday morning, and sitting in the tree stand, and I'm in this tree stand up on top of a hill looking down over kind of a, a, a field up into other hills up in Calhoun County, and uh, totally quiet when you're out there in the dark. And every once in a while, you'd hear an owl hoot, and that's about it. And as I'm facing east, and I'm looking, and there's kind of this tree line on this next ridge line, and the dark blue sky slowly starts to get a little light blue. No sun yet, but right about that time, I hear this rooster off in the distance crowing. And uh, shortly after that, not 30 seconds after that, I hear this first squirrel starting to scurry down this tree to my right. And he's down into the leaves, you know, doing what he does. And then a little shortly after that, I hear a bird start to chirp. And slowly things come to life, you know. And uh, it's probably 20 minutes after that, starting to see now a little bit of orange in the sky. And you can kind of see the sun behind a tree line. And a rooster crows again. I'm sitting here going, now, isn't that typical? So God gave us an alarm clock through the rooster. Amen? And he's sitting there, not when the sun's fully risen. He does it a half an hour beforehand so that we can get up and get showered and get ready and be out there ready to work when the sun is up. But he gives us kind of a snooze feature because 20, 25 minutes later, he crows again. And I'm sitting there just thinking about how simple that is when we think about God of wonders, I'm like, we don't need this iPhone with an alarm clock. We just pay attention to the rooster. Isn't that amazing? And so anyway, I'm just thinking about that as I was sitting there yesterday morning. And as we get ready to sing, give us clean hands, the second line of the first verse, oh spirit, come make us humble. So not only do we think about the God of wonders, right? But give us humility in the things that we think this phone and these alarms that make us so great when we're so humble, when you just go sit out and look at the ways he's already provided, when you take the time, folks. So think about that as we sing this and go through your day, just the ways he's already provided for us in a rooster. Amen. We bow our hearts. We bend our knees. Oh, Spirit, come.
Amen. And now it's time for all of our little ones that we are so very thankful for to head to junior church right now. That would be the kids from birth all the way up to fifth grade. We got a lot of tall kids going out with them, so we're just going to turn turn the other way. Yeah. And while they're heading out, let's just all take a moment just to say a little prayer for them, okay? Dear Lord, thank you so very, very much for this morning. Thank you for bringing those children here to church so that they might learn about you. Watch over them as they're in their classrooms. Keep them always in your care. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A lot of songs really don't need too much of an introduction. This one, the words are beautiful. Just Holy Spirit, we welcome you here. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living home. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of love, where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Let's lift it up to him. Invite him here today. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory. the 
this day, um, you've brought each one of us into this room, and man, we know how easy it is to just walk through our days and weeks half asleep, half aware. Um, Wake us up, God. Wake us up to your glory, to your love, your grace. Wake us up to the hope that only you can give. Uh, Revive us, God. Um, Help us as we... um, come together today to leave here empowered and and ready to face another week. God, we just, we want to be overwhelmed by your presence. We love you, Jesus, and we're just so grateful for your love for us. In your name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. There is a a difference between being present and being present, right? That there is a way in which uh, a teacher can take attendance in class. And it's, I don't know if it's still done anymore, but it was done when I was growing up. They just like spit out the name, either first name or last name, and you're supposed to say here or present. And all of us probably have had moments and days where we have been able to affirmatively say, yes, we are physically present, but that's about it. And then there are moments where we are in the moment and aware of all of the things that are going on around us. And God invites us to experience him with that kind of awareness, with that kind of experience. And in all the time, we're invited to show up or not show up with other people, with sporting events, with work, with study, with play, We can do something wholeheartedly or half-heartedly. And Jesus says that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with half your heart and most of your soul and a little bit of your strength and about a fraction of your mind. And we know that's not true. It's all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, all of your mind. And when we begin to actually look at those alls, and then if we're brave enough to look at ourselves in the mirror, we look and go, wow, I fall short. I hold back. I'm not all there. And I think that when I come to an awareness of that, which only can happen through the Holy Spirit's conviction, 
God looks at me and smiles and says, now I can help you get there. That the first step in loving God with all of our heart and soul and strength and mind is first acknowledging the fact, God, I don't. I don't the way I want to. So what would it look like if if we just pause even before we hear any word from the word today and just kind of say, I I want to love you, Lord. And I know that my love for you is imperfect. But I know that your love for me is perfect. Perfect. And because you love me perfectly, you will be merciful and kind and gracious with me to help me move from one degree of love to the next, to the next. Let's pray. God, we do deeply desire to become more aware of your presence with us. The last thing I want to do this morning is go through the motions of church. But if left to myself, I will. I need you. We need you. So we ask, Lord, that you would take our imperfect love for you and help us to be engaged today with our hearts, our minds, our souls, our bodies. Help us to be present to you and to each other and to your work in our midst. And God, when we're not there, convict us. But Lord, we know when you convict us, you do it gently. You only cut us in order to heal us. You never cut us to butcher us. Thank you for your loving kindness and steadfast love toward your people. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Corinth also wrestled with this inability to love as we're supposed to with all of our heart. And what's interesting is sometimes we can become so distracted that, or we can become so hurt that we build up some kind of callousness. And instead of loving deeply, we just kind of say it hurts too much to love deeply and to trust. So I will keep people at an arm's distance or an arm's length. I will constantly be wondering with each person I come into contact with, what's your angle? What's your agenda? Why are you being so kind to me? And God does not want us to live life that way. So this week, I heard a very appropriate quote as we talked last week about the importance of love in 1 Corinthians 13 and realizing that love never ends and love never fails, which immediately caused us to think about loved ones that have gone on to be with the Lord. And I came across this Wednesday. Grief never ends, but it changes It's a passage, not a place to stay. Grief is not a sign of weakness, nor a lack of faith. It is the price of love. Grief is the price of love. We can look and go, okay, well, that's true, and that makes sense, and when I think about my loved ones, Yes, I feel that. And now let's expand it out a little bit more because Paul's going to tell us again, the very first two words of 1 Corinthians 14 say, pursue love. And when we pursue love, we have to acknowledge that sometimes we may pursue love 
and love will not be reciprocated. And I don't know about you, but like, I don't really genuinely know anyone that likes rejection. It does not give warm, fuzzy feelings to be rejected. And we may try to blow it off, but it hurts. And we have to ask ourselves as those who walk with Christ, am I willing to pursue love and to take the risk of potential rejection? And then that in that, We can think about loved ones that have passed away, but we can also think about people that are present in our lives and here and now. That are we going to pursue love toward them? And the Corinthians are dysfunctional and they struggle. And we've jokingly said ever since June that it sure is a good thing the people of the bridge are nothing like the Corinthians. We have our act together They didn't. But I did read this week someone say, specifically about this chapter, that this particular group of believers is actually so messed up that it's amazing that at the end of this letter, Paul didn't write something like, and by the way, this is your last church service and worship gathering. We are bolting the doors after this. You are doing so much more damage than good. We are disbanding the congregation that one person who has studied Bible theology and scholarly work came to that conclusion that it's absolutely amazing Paul did not say that to them. But then he didn't stop there. He said, but that's not our God. Our God is one who can take us when we are at our absolute worst and say, I'm not done with you yet that your success does not depend on your faithfulness to me, but I will get you all the way home because it's my faithfulness to you. Philippians 1, 6, that we can be confident of this, that he who starts and begins a good work in us will carry it out to completion until the day when we meet Christ Jesus, that there is hope in the midst of this, And that hope needs to be highlighted because there's going to be some rebuke and some correction as well. And just like I do not like rejection, I also do not like rebuke and correction. I love it when people say, oh, you have it all together. Because deep down inside, I know that I don't always have it all together. And when someone says, oh, you actually need to work on this and this and this and this, I go, yeah, you're you're probably right, but I don't really always want to hear that. And there's two ways that we can respond to correction, right? There's also two kinds of people that can correct us. There are people who can correct us who we know love us. And it's a whole lot easier to receive correction from someone like that. And then there are people who correct us just to kind of get us told. And sadly, the projection of truth that the Corinthians think about Paul, they do not believe, not all of them, because Paul's even had to defend himself in this letter. Some of them have forgotten how deeply Paul loves them. And some of you may sometimes forget how deeply your heavenly father loves you. That each moment of each day, that the Lord is pointing out something to you. He is not pointing it out to you to condemn you, but to convict you toward healing and toward a closer walk with him that leads to more hope and peace and joy. So what is the rebuke today? The rebuke has to do with prophecy and tons. I asked my kids this morning, guys, what does it mean to speak in tons? And Sophie immediately said, isn't that like Peter picked a pipe of of the the, the ton twisters? Isn't that, and if you get going so fast, it just kind of becomes gibberish? And I smiled and went, all right, this is uncharted territory for a lot of us. So you can go ahead and put on your metaphorical seatbelt. We're going for a ride. 
Here we go. 1 Corinthians 14, beginning with verse 1. We'll read through verse 25. This is God's word to us today. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries and the spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now, I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, How will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? If even lifeless instruments such as the flute or the harp do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? So with yourselves, if with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, How will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker a foreigner to me. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray for the power to interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, How can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what what your thanksgiving, when he does not know what you are saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a ton. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants and in evil, but in your thinking, be mature. In the law it is written, by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners will I speak to this people, and even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Thus tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers while prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers, but for believers. If therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are out of your minds? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all, he is called to account by all, the secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. So there is a lot at stake in making sure that we get this right. So I'm gonna pray one more time. God, help us today understand your word and apply it to our lives and hearts. May we lift up your son, our savior and Lord. Jesus Christ, it's in his name we pray, amen. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. It is that time of year when you get asked the question, what would you like 
for Christmas, right? And some of us already have some things on our list that we would like for Christmas. And depending on the degree with which you want what you want for Christmas, it's been known to sometimes occupy a dream or two of mine. Like, oh, if I can just have this thing, and I really want this thing. Or imagine something like this. You have worked and saved and worked and saved and worked and saved. And finally, the day comes where you have enough money to buy what you want to buy. You can fill in the blank of what that is, okay? You can think of a few things that I did want to buy for myself, a uh, uh, got to a place where I knew I needed to contribute a certain amount of money for a car. Um, and then when that day came, you know, and especially if you're close to 16 and uh, someone in our church, I don't want to put her on this, and actually she may not be here, to, but Jenna, uh, you can wave real quick. I'm, she's going to talk to me later. But Jenna turned 16 in like two days, right? Two days? Okay. So like probably like the idea of wheels and travel, like 16th birthday is one of the most exciting birthdays. But then there comes other times in our lives where we're pursuing something, okay? A lot of times, you know, and guys, those of you who are married, hopefully remember that day in your lives where you realize like, this is the woman I want to be with for the rest of my life. And you pursue that woman, but sometimes pursuing that woman also means entering into a jewelry store and buying a ring as a sign and seal of that. And for a lot of guys, that means coming up with some kind of payment plan as well and working toward pursuing this thing. And guys, there are things we pursue and we pursue them earnestly with deep, deep desire. If you're a parent, so much of what you do for your children is to pursue them, to learn about their hearts, to pray that they will be physically and emotionally and mentally and spiritually healthy. And you pursue that. And Paul is inviting the people of God who have been taken out of darkness into light and adopted into his family as sons and daughters of the King of Kings. He's inviting us to say, I want you to pursue your heavenly father in a way that causes you to say, Father in heaven, I know that you give good gifts to your children. And I am not pursuing you just to get the gift, but I am pursuing you and asking you for the gifts in order to know you and love you and follow you and be equipped with power to glorify you more. This is also the time of year when the leaves fall. I love fall when the leaves are still on the trees and they're colorful. But once the leaves fall, I don't like it very much because there are a lot in my yard. So actually yesterday, Daria and I are brainstorming about what we're gonna do with our leaves this year. And uh, she asked, Should, can't you buy like a leaf vacuum cleaner of sorts that you just come and you just suck them up and it just mulches in? So we researched leaf vacuum cleaners and I begin to realize, I'm like, you know, maybe those things work. I may need to talk to you guys a little bit about those later. But I just continued to go back to the thought process of, at a certain point, it all comes back to the rake, though, it seems. Like, <laughs> there's this certain point, no matter what tool you have, it seems like you have to do a certain amount of raking no matter what. Or maybe I'm just not very good with the equipment. But gifts are gifts, but gifts given by God are also tools. And if there is a leaf vacuum cleaner that effectively sucks up the leaves and mulches them, and then you put them in a bag, and then boom, it's done, it probably makes the job easier. And I don't know about you, 
But there are certain things that this book calls me to do that in and of myself, I don't even have the want to, to do it. And I need tools. I need gifts from God to make my have to turn into a want to. I need the Lord to perform that miracle in my heart. And Paul is inviting the Corinthians here to say, I want you to pursue those things that cause you to love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself and glorify Jesus as the King of Kings. I want you to pursue that. So then I begin to think like, okay, well, what does pursuit look like? And brought me back to what it looks like for a man in love to pursue the person he wants to marry. That at a certain point, there is no amount of money that's too much. There's no amount of time that's too much. There's no amount of sacrifice that's too much. And then I begin to kind of gauge on the barometer. I'm like, am I pursuing the spiritual gifts of God like I pursued my wife? And then there's a better question that relates to marriage. Am I pursuing my wife now the same way I was when I asked her to marry me? Am I pursuing my kids with the same moment that they they were uh, night owls, they were born at like 12.54 a.m. and 1.02 a.m.? If that sounds silly and you don't know me well, I have twins. Um, And they're eight minutes apart, but I was up all night long staring at them. And they were sleeping. And then they woke up when I needed sleep. And I forgot, oops, I probably, even though I was on this crazy high and I'm memorizing every little feature on their face, I probably should have slept because now I'm sleep deprived and I may not be the man, husband, or dad I need to be to take care of them because sleep is good and godly. But we pursue the things that we love. So before we get into tons and prophecy today, and we will touch on them, the most disheartening thing that I experienced in studying this passage this week was going to a website that has a lot of sermons preached on this text and finding out that nearly every single one of those sermons was basically arguing either four tons still exist today or that tons don't exist today. And I was deeply disheartened because the very beginning of this says, I want you to pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. And guess what, guys? It's up to God what gifts he gives to us. And it's actually not even up to us to fully understand the gifts that he gives to us or why he's given us the gift that he's given us. We need to learn it and exercise it But it is not about Christians needing to argue and fight and disagree when the very first few words are pursue love. And Todd Plummer in his email this week made that very clear. And um, thank you for that, Todd. But Paul does say in the second half of verse one, but especially desire the gift of prophecy. And Jeff Maynard said before church today that it was an interesting dynamic that a few weeks ago in chapter 12, we heard about how every single person is a part of the body. We're all each a member of it. And there is no one gift that's more important than other gifts. And now in chapter 14, it seems like Paul's almost contradicting himself and saying, oh, by the way, but the one that's the most important is prophecy. And prophecy is better than tons. So what is happening here? What is prophecy? What is tons? What does it have to do with the church in Corinth? What does it have to do for us today? So first of all, it may be easiest to define tons. And uh, it's possible that maybe a ton twister may cause you to break out in a ton later, but a ton twister in and of itself is not tons, right? The Bible highlights two different kinds of ton speaking. And one we're going to put in this big category of missiological, 
okay? And missiological is a fancy word that says there are moments and times where God wants to get his message to people that don't understand it. And that if there is a person who knows the Lord, that God can give them the gift of speaking in a language that they have never studied before so that the hearer can hear the good news about Jesus in their own language. People are like, well, when did that happen? Thanks for asking. First of all, we need to go back in time to when everyone had the same language. And boy, wouldn't that be kind of cool. Um, that'd be really cool, I think. Tower of Babel, Genesis 11, all the people had the same language and they decide to make a name for themselves and build a tower to God. And they all are united about building a tower to God, but sadly, it's not to get closer to God, it's to show God that they can be gods themselves. So at a certain point in time, and I don't know if God snapped his finger, I'm not exactly sure what happened, but something happened to where Each person there is speaking different languages and basically the construction of the tower stops and they all disband. And now we have multiple languages in the world. When we try to usurp God of his authority and power and glory, it will lead to confusion and failure. And eventually they disband. But then we have Pentecost where Jesus says, I want you to wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon you. And when he does, then you're going to receive power. And the power will specifically be for the purpose of being my witnesses. So at Pentecost, you have thousands of Jews that migrate to Jerusalem for this holy day, but they all speak different languages. And Peter comes out and the others and there's a wind and then there's like tons hitting and there's a physical manifestation of all of these things. And like I said earlier, we don't have to understand it all to say, wow, God, you're pretty amazing. And then Peter begins to preach. And some people say this is a gift of hearing. I think maybe, yeah, or a gift of speaking. And I think at that point, we may already be splitting hairs a little bit. Okay, here's the miracle that happened. Peter preached, he did not know multiple languages, but multiple people who speak multiple languages heard the good news of Jesus all in their same language and 3,000 were saved in that one day. So you'll go, okay, well, that's awesome, but that's like Bible times. What about today? I'll share one story from a guy that I trust and have deep, deep respect for about a person that he knew in college who had recently become a Christian. And you know, when we recently become Christians, we're very much, uh, we're very aware, right? God has opened our eyes and we're like, I'll never be the same. And this guy is so excited about this grace that has found him and saved him and rescued him. And he's found music that is praise unto God that he loves to play and he got his little cassette tape player out, okay? So it was quite a while ago. And he's pushing play, and he's singing, and, and, and he's excited, and he's experiencing God, and then all of a sudden, he begins to pray. And as he's praying, before he knows it, he's not speaking English anymore. He's speaking something else, but he continues to feel the presence of God in profound ways. So he just keeps on going with it. And then finally kind of stops, and then he hears a knock on his dorm room door. And he goes and opens it up, and it's an Asian student that says, how do you know Mandarin Chinese? The man, the other guy says, I, I, I don't know Mandarin Chinese. That's not true, because I overheard you. First, you were singing. And then you begin speaking in Mandarin Chinese. And not only do you know my language very, very well, you are saying things about me that no one else knows. At which point the man says, I don't know what happened. I can tell you this. A few months ago, I became a Christian. 
I began to realize all that Jesus did for me on the cross, and I asked him to come and save and rescue me, and I want to obey him and live my life for him, and I was just worshiping. But I will say this, and he said, and it has never happened before, said, I was speaking in some language I didn't understand, but I just felt more and more closer to God, so I just kept going with it. The man immediately said, tell me more about Jesus. And it wasn't very long before he became a Christian. When Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 14 here about how tons are signs for unbelievers, this is part of it. The missiological movement of the day is that sometimes God will bestow upon a person a supernatural gift and oftentimes it's for the purpose of there's someone I'm calling to myself and I am going to make my message known. Now, it is true that in today's day and age, we have these things called Google Translate, right? That there are other ways and other means by which we can communicate the message, but it is extremely important for you and I not to discount that God can work in ways we don't understand. It's the greatest miracle of all, guys. God worked in a way in your heart to bring you out of darkness into his light and to awaken you spiritually to where you have a desire to know him and love him and walk with him. And that that is the greatest of all miracles. So there's a missiological form of speaking in tongues. And then there are people that have been given a gift of tongues in it, some kind of private prayer language. And just for notice here, Paul says in verse four of 1 Corinthians 14, the one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself. Now we can look at this and go, well, what does that mean? To be completely honest, I don't know exactly. But I do know this, that there are moments and times where the intensity of what a person may be going through and experiencing is so deep and so difficult or so amazing that you don't know how to put it into words. But you want to communicate in some way. And that God is saying in this that there is a way to commune with me where you will be built up and you will experience a greater intimacy and relationship with Jesus through prayer in this way than at other times. And here's the thing, guys. Before we talk about how prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues, let's not say speaking in tongues is all bad. Because Paul says, when you speak in a tongue, you build yourself up. It is not bad to build yourself up. It is bad when all you want to do is build yourself up. Building yourself up is a means to an end and can never be the end in itself. But we've all had those days where we know we've been running on fumes and our loved ones need more from us than we have to give. And the fancy word for it today, and I believe the gospel highlights this as important, we're not called to be selfish, but we are called to give ourselves appropriate self-care. And sometimes the church gets this wrong. Sometimes the church has the attitude of, well, you know, it's hard to follow Jesus, and that's just the cross I'm called to bear. well, you just really made a whole bunch of people want to be Christians. I'm not saying that there aren't difficult crosses to bear, but I'm saying that whenever I try to bear my cross in my own strength, the cross will collapse on me. And then I can say, Jesus, I need you. And I can pray and read the word and worship and gather with people who can encourage me all forms of self-care, 
all forms of being within earshot of hearing the gospel. And then before I know it, the Spirit of God fills me in a way to where I say, yes, I have this cross to bear, but I have a strength and I have wind in my sails that I did not know was there before, and I can pursue this now. And that there is a gift like this. Now, it's important, okay? Does everyone have the gift of speaking in tongues? No, is it really, really easy to ask for? I think we're called to ask for these things. I think the Bible makes that clear of whatever gift it is, we're called to ask for the gifts, and then we trust the sovereign hand of God to give us the gifts that we need. And we trust God to say yes or no to whatever gift we ask for. And when he says no, or when he says not yet, we say, okay, God, I trust you. Give me faith that I need to walk with you and follow you, even if I don't get everything that I want. Those of you who took a foreign language in high school or college, you might have prayed, hey, God, can I pass that Spanish exam without studying? Problem with that is it doesn't have a lot of missiological motivation in it. It's not to tell people about Jesus. It actually encourages perhaps a little bit, and I was kind of that guy in Spanish 3 in high school, but a little bit of your laziness and failure to study and apply yourself because God gave us a mind also. But that there is a purpose for this. And even though the Corinthians are abusing it, we don't want to look at the abuse and then say, because it's abused so many places, it may never have a proper use. So what does that look like? For me, it's looked like a lot of times where I'm like, God, I don't even want to pray right now, but I know I should. Would you please help me? Would you please give me a sense of your presence? I want to be all in. I want to know you, and I know I'm not all in right now. Would you help me? And you know what is amazing about that prayer? And I've got scripture grounding. Hebrews 7.25 says that Jesus is able to save you and I completely because he lives to intercede for you and me. That when I pray and say, God, I need you more, Jesus is on it. Do you know, brother and sister, today that you are on Jesus's prayer list and that his prayers are effectual because he was the only perfectly righteous man and they will availeth on your behalf. You are on Jesus's prayer list. But then Paul says, tons are good, but prophecy is better. So what is prophecy? Some people define prophecy as the preaching and proclaiming of the word of God. Well, if that's prophecy, then not very many of us have it, right? I've invited people on occasion to get up and share a testimony or to, hey, have you ever considered preaching? And a lot of times people are like, oh, And that's okay, because not everybody has that gift and that calling. But I do believe that 1 Corinthians 14 does say that we are called to pursue and earnestly ask for the gift of prophecy. And if that means that this is one of the priority gifts of God, it would make sense that God would probably give that gift to more people that are just called into a preaching, teaching ministry in the church, right? So then what is prophecy? Prophecy is the ability to deliver a word for God for such a time as this. And sometimes the word that a believer is called to deliver to another believer can be a verse out of this book. But the verse that is delivered out of this book 
at that moment, at that time, immediately brings profound impact to the heart and mind of the hearer. This is not a rehearsed kind of, I want to be careful because I know that God has used things like the faith outline and evangelism explosion for incredible evangelistic efforts, okay? But when you're trained in a program like evangelistic explosion, is that what it's called? Anyway, or the Roman road to salvation, like you kind of learn a script and you're sharing the script with other people, right? As you're sharing the script with the other people, you gotta ask yourself, are you praying? You could be praying, but you may not be praying. You may just be walking through the script. So as we pursue love and earnestly desire the deepest gifts, what it's an invitation to really is a call to say, God, I'm going to meet with so-and-so for lunch today and I don't know what they need to hear from you. But I am asking you to fill me with your spirit and wisdom and knowledge in such a way that I deliver the word from you that they need to hear. And that is how prophecy and love are married together. When you are praying for a person that you come into contact with, either that is a scheduled meeting or a chance encounter, and you are saying, God, I want to encourage them, but I want to do more than encourage them. I want to deliver a word to them from you. Would you please give me something for this person at this time? Now, do you have to say, well, I was praying for you an hour before this meeting and God gave me this word for you. I would strongly discourage that. Because here's the thing that happens, guys. Sometimes, most of the time, the person will know. The person will know that the the They need that word from God, from you. I'll give you a quick example because sometimes God will make us aware and make it clear. And sometimes it's just pretty supernatural. But I think it's important to make sure that we're asking God for this. Um, So I had an opportunity to be a youth ministry intern at a church right after college And it was a summer gig that I was hoping would extend past the summer. And it became only a summer gig. And when I found out that it was only a summer thing, I was pretty deeply disheartened. And when I found out that it was only a summer thing, um, I realized, wow, I really love these youth. I am really going to miss this. And then they wanted to throw me a party. And I didn't really quite know how to receive the party that was going to be thrown for me because I didn't want the thing to end. Like, how about you skip the party and just let me continue to be the youth minister here? But that wasn't in the cards. I just graduated from college. I'd become engaged in March. It's August. And I'm looking at the end of August. And at this point, I don't have a job either. So from then until I got married, I'm I'm doing like all kinds of three, four, five odd end jobs. But at that party, I was given a picture that's framed that I have in my office still to this day that has this verse on it. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, a plan to give you a hope and a future, Jeremiah 29, 11. And I read that at the party. In full confession, I thought, yeah, God, okay. Sure feels like that right now. 
And then we had our youth gathering and uh, we, we sang songs and I spoke for about 20 minutes, believe it or not. I used to be able to only speak for 20 minutes. And, uh, and then we had a response time where people can come forward and pray. And I responded to the, my own sermon that I preached. I just, I was emotionally, spiritually spent and wrecked. And I'm like, God, I, I don't even care. I need you. And I went down to my knees and just said, God, help, help. I'm going to miss this so much. And then before I know it, there's a hand on my back, and it happens to be in my dad's hand. My dad missed the party. But my dad put his hand on my shoulder and whispered in my ear, Stephen, God told me you're supposed to hear this. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. A plan to give you a hope and a future. That was prophecy. That was a word from the word for such a time as I needed it in that moment. Why in the world would you and I as believers who have a heavenly father who says, I want to give you those gifts. Why in the world will we not ask for them? the amount of healing and the amount of glory that God received by that superseded anything that my dad or I could have studied or prayed up or manufactured in our own strength. It was a wave that the Holy Spirit created. And to take it even a little bit further, Jeremiah 29, 11 is deeply impactful to a few of you out in the sanctuary today for other reasons. And it just so happens that you're here today. And then we have to ask, will we receive that word of prophecy that God is with us and God is alive and active in our lives and he's not forgotten us or forsaken us. Because you know what happens when we exercise prophecy in this way? People who are doubters and skeptics and question, they look and go, I give up. <laughs> there is no way that that could have been completely manufactured. That's from God. And Paul says, don't turn what is going to build up the church into something that is going to broadcast your skill or your agenda or your spiritual superstardom. It's not about that. It's about building up each other and the faith. So what does application look like here? The application, first and foremost, looks like this. We are called to wait upon the Lord. It's, it's interesting that we tend to not be a very patient people. And God says, if you want power and awareness of my presence, the prerequisite is wait upon me. And I've experienced oftentimes where I think God moves very slowly. And I'm like, God, let's go here. Let's go. And there are even times where I've it's come at nine o'clock Sunday morning and I still don't exactly know what to say. I'm like, come on, God. I don't have any more time to wait. If you want a word of prophecy from God, you have to wait on him. You have to be with him. You have to walk with him. I mentioned in a Bible study yesterday at Robert's shop that uh, we need to share this good news of great joy more often. And a brother looked at me and smiled and said, maybe we just need to be and trust that the light that God puts in us 
will be the share. Now, he's not saying by that, don't share. But he's making sure I don't put the cart before the horse and say, go out and share. First, be with Jesus. Second, share about your encounters with him. If you never are with Jesus, you're gonna have very little to share about Jesus with other people. So the first application point is wait on him, be with him, and walk with him. And then number two, say, God, my life is a blank check to you. And as much as I know how I want to be obedient in word and deed and thought, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. You know what that means? You pray a prayer like that, God's gonna show you some things in your life in which you have been disobedient. And your thoughts and your actions, and he's gonna say, hey, you're holding on to this. Are you gonna let go of it? Do you mean what you say? Or are you just saying it? And then we really do have to want it. There is a pursuit here. Pursue love, earnestly desire the greatest gifts, of which the Bible tells us here, prophecy is one. And then we ask and we receive. And guys, the worst thing that can happen when you pray for someone that you know you may see, the worst thing that can happen is you prayed for someone that you might see. And I don't think that's a very bad thing. The best thing that could happen is you are able to deliver a word to that person for such a time as whatever it is they're going through and whatever it is they need. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for the gift of tons and prophecy. Lord, we don't want to uh, mess this up. We want to exercise it in a way that brings you glory and that builds us up in our faith. And Lord, at the end of it all, we just, we just want to tell you that we love you. I thank you for the way in which you helped people show up today. I felt an awareness and a hunger on the part of my church family this morning. And I'm thankful for them. And I ask, Lord, that you would grant us gifts of prof prophetic words for each other so we can build each other up in the faith. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The very last verse says that when we are filled with the Spirit and sensitive to the Spirit and hearing from the Lord and then sharing with others what we hear, that the secrets of one who doesn't know the Lord are disclosed. And as those secrets are disclosed, that that person will fall on his face and worship God and declare that God is really among you. In fact, prophetic words may be for the believer, but they affect the unbeliever and bring the unbeliever to faith in Christ as well. This is a older, simple praise chorus that some of you as you're hearing it being played right now already go, oh wow, an oldie but a goodie maybe. Not quite as old as a hymn. But as I prayed through this text and thought about, God, how do we finish this? It made sense that the simplest way to finish it is just simply to sing, I love you, Lord. I love you. You're a good father who gives good gifts to your children. And I want to raise my voice I want to lift my voice and just let you know I love you.
invite you to stand and do that now. gathering and prepare to spread out through this town, through this county. The Bible says that God sent Jesus to heal the brokenhearted, to bind up those who are hurting, to set captives free. And when the Holy Spirit fell at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, God gave his people the comforter and the one who would continually remind you and I of all that God has done for us. The one who says, when you are concerned about what you may say, don't be. I'll give you the right word at the right time for the right person. You are aware today. You are active in your listening and your engagement. And that's good. But it's better after leaving this gathering for us to be active in our listening to the Lord and active in recognizing, God, you brought this person to me. Why? Help me to pray. Help me to lift up. Help me to encourage. And God, help me to hear. If there is a special word from you that they need to hear from me, give me faith to be obedient, to deliver it, and trust then the Holy Spirit will take it and do what I can never do with it. That is our God. Let's receive this benediction. And now, God, to you, the one who pursues us, may we this week pursue you and pursue love and earnestly desire the gifts that you give to us 
so we may build up the body and witness others enter into that body. For your glory and in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. May you go with God's grace and peace.